I've got a couple follow-up comments on the previous podcast about whether men and women can be friends. I think the question is a lot like, should I do Christmas with my kid? Suppose that you're planning to have a kid soon, um, and you have a lot of criticisms of Christmas. You, you can think of things that are dumb about it, like gift giving is less efficient than buying things yourself that you choose. Like you can pick out stuff for yourself better than someone else can. And getting things on Christmas means waiting. Most of the stuff you got on Christmas you could have had sooner. Even stuff that is released for Christmas as a product usually comes out like a month before Christmas. Um, they want to release things before Black Friday, before Thanksgiving. Like there's a lot of video games that come out around then so that they'll be available for Christmas, but they don't just like release it on December 24th or on Christmas Day. You know, if you don't wait for Christmas Day, you can play earlier, you can have something earlier. And with a lot of other stuff, um, you could just buy it any time during the year. So there's plenty of things you could have had like three months earlier that got waited until Christmas. That's a common thing that happens. People have to wait a long time. So that's bad. And if you think about it rationally and you're critical and you question Christmas, you can see a lot of things wrong with it. And Santa's a myth and the whole Jesus stuff is a myth. And it's not just a myth like in the sense that Jesus is a myth. Um, also in my not very researched understanding... Uh, Christmas was a pagan holiday, and then the Christians made up the stuff. They, like, moved Jesus' birthday um, in order to steal it. Is it his birthday or something else? Christmas. I'm Googling. I'm not a very good Christian. I've never been Christian. Yeah, it's Jesus' birthday, supposedly. But, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I read that they just moved his birthday um, so that they could steal the holiday from the pagans and and claim it as a religious holiday. Yeah, there's a some random Google result is saying a careful analysis of scripture, however, clearly indicates that December twenty fifth couldn't be the date for Christ's birth. Anyway, without researching it, I find that very plausible that they would move the date and steal the holiday. Um, like if they couldn't stamp it out and say no, you should only do our religious holidays. It makes sense to just put an important religious holiday on the major pagan one to gain influence and importance in the world. Anyway, so there's a lot of things wrong with Christmas, and Santa is silly. Like, first of all, people lie to kids and say Santa's real, and they threaten the kids, like, you'll get coal in your stocking, he's watching you, he knows if you're naughty or nice, he has a list. They do these rituals, like writing letters to the North Pole. Um, so there's a bunch of ridiculous stuff there that you can definitely take objection to. And I definitely don't think you should do every aspect of Christmas. Like, I do I do not think you should lie to your kids that Santa is real. Um, you can tell them that Santa is a myth from the beginning and still have a nice, fun Christmas that they're pleased with and happy with. Like, if you just cancel Christmas, a lot of kids are going to be disappointed and they're not going to see Christmas the same way you do. Like, you don't care that much about it and you see a bunch of intellectual problems with it, but your kid probably still wants Christmas. But um, a lot of kids get sad about Santa not being real because they've been lied to for years. So when they find out, it's kind of traumatic. But I think if you don't lie to them in the first place, it's fine. Anyway, the reason I wanted to make this comparison is it's similar to the can men and women be friends because it's an issue of should I follow a standard cultural tradition? And my answer in the Christmas case is basically yes. Um, even though there's things wrong with criticism and you can intellectually criticize it, if your kid wants it, you should give him Christmas. And you should expect your kid to want it and don't discourage him too much. Like, you can tell him, like, minor, like, objections and, you know, it's not your favorite. You can tell him what you think, but you shouldn't be, like, very discouraging or pressuring about it. You shouldn't tell him if he wants it, he's irrational. You shouldn't imply that or let him think that or pressure him, you know? You should tell him that's completely fine if he wants Christmas and presents can be fun and you're willing to do that and and so on and so forth. And I know people who have done that, who have told their kid things like, um, I can give you things like now, just I'll buy you things when I get them and give them to you. Or I can like save some of them for Christmas so you can have uh, things under the Christmas tree. 
But if I do that, then you'll get them later. You'll have to wait more. You know, you can offer your kid that. And plenty of kids will want to wait for some of the things because they like Christmas. And making that offer is not pressuring them. It's not telling them. It's telling them there's a downside to waiting, but it's not like telling them that it's awful or a bad choice. Like it's it's not that bad, you know. Christmas is an easier thing to change your mind about, or change your emotions about, or feel differently about, or look at it in a different way than um, guys and girls being friends. It's like a significantly easier case. Um, love and romance and all that stuff is like a much stronger, more powerful thing that has a lot more sway in people's lives um, than Christmas. Christmas is like a, a fairly big deal, but it's not comparable to like courtship and marriage and that kind of stuff. So I think it's good to look at like smaller examples so you can get some sense of perspective. Like the guys and girls trying to be friends thing is harder than going against your culture on Christmas which is harder to go into their culture on Christmas than, uh, say, Thanksgiving or Easter or Valentine's Day. A lot of people would have a lot of trouble going against their culture on Valentine's Day. They would not want to disappoint their girlfriend, and they would not want to rationally discuss it with her. Or even if they did and they both agreed that they weren't going to do Valentine's Day, they'd be worried that she would still, like, emotionally hold it against them and it wouldn't actually go well for them so a lot of guys would rather just buy her some chocolates and flowers on valentine's day it's not that expensive it's not worth the risk um etc but i would say valentine's day is less of a big deal than christmas um which is significantly less of a big deal than guys and girls being friends stuff so if you would think going against your culture on Valentine's Day is hard, you probably shouldn't try to be friends with a girl. But on the other hand, if the Valentine's Day one sounds easy to you, and you have the kind of relationships and attitude to life and so on, where you think that would be completely fine and you wouldn't be worried at all, um, you might be fooling yourself, but maybe that means you would have a chance at something harder than Valentine's Day. Um, still not close to the level of like a long-term semi-close uh, friendship with a girl where you just like somehow don't get any romantic feelings or whatever. All right, and now I have a second uh, follow-up comment on this, which I have some notes for. So I wanted to mention the notes because most of what I say is totally unscripted and I don't give it much thought beforehand. Um, a lot of it I have like literally no notes. For the Christmas one, I just wrote down, um, can men and women be friends is like, quote, should I do Xmas with my kid? Um, and that was all I wrote because I thought of it uh, yesterday, but I was tired, so I saved the podcast for today, so I didn't want to forget that point. So I wrote literally one sentence, and then I talked for eight minutes based on one sentence. Um, but for the next section, I actually have like five paragraphs of notes because I had a bunch of thoughts about it, but I was too tired to podcast, so I wanted to save them. So it's more scripted than usual. Um, when I have notes, I'm often, I post them to the Fallible Ideas discussion list so that uh, more like regular members of the community can see a bit of behind the scenes stuff if they want to. If that interests you, you can go to fallibleideas.com and then at the top, uh, click on discussion, and you can sign up for the email group. Okay, so my other follow-up comments are about love. So love is dangerous in ways that people gloss over today and don't like take seriously and respect. In the ancient world, Cupid shot arrows. Well, he still shoots arrows, but in the ancient world, Arrows were like a fearsome weapon. They weren't cute like today. Um, before gunpowder, arrows were the scariest weapon in the world. Like, they could kill you at a distance. Um, in a way that feels like very unfair. And also, if you got hit with an arrow, um, they were often barbed, 
and they'd be hard to pull out. Sometimes you had to push them like through a limb or something. Um, and medicine was very bad, so often the wounds would like fester and get infected, and you would die later in a very like slow, painful way. That was a thing that happened a lot. And it, that was worse with arrows that go into your skin than with, um, like if you get hit with a sword and you got like a slash on your side, but it's not super bad, you know, your armor blocks part of it or something. Um, that's not going to be as bad of a wound. It's still bad, but um, it's often not going to be as bad as an arrow that actually like goes inside of you. It has like more of a chance to heal, I think. Not a doctor. Anyway, so arrows, seriously fucking scary. And people would shoot, like, in, in battles with big armies. They would get, like, a couple hundred archers all together, and they'd all shoot at once. You'd have this giant fucking cloud of arrows um, flying up and just landing in your army, and a bunch of people die. And it's just, like, random if you die. It's not like when you go up and you're swinging your weapons at each other, and you have, like, your shield, and you can block things. Um... I mean, later the, the Romans got good at, uh, like, holding up interlocking shields in order to take a lot less damage from arrows. And maybe the Greeks did that a bit, but basically, yeah, arrows were really dangerous in this, like, unfair way where it's just, like, some people die. And then the battle, um, once the battle starts, like, more clearly then it's hard to shoot arrows because you can hit your own side. Um, like once the fighting gets like mixed up, all the people are together, the arrows stop as much, but the beginning is just a bunch of people die and it's random and you just sort of hope you don't get hit. It's awful. So the point is Cupid shot arrows because people were scared of love. They thought it was really dangerous. That was a common attitude in the Greek world and just in the past in general. Um, today, there's all this, like, casual hookups, and um, divorce is common, and so on, and, and people don't think about love the same way. But in the past, and I think this is mostly correct, um, love, called eros by the Greeks, was seen as a dangerous force that had to be controlled. People had to have self-control against temptation. There were societal structures to, like, marriage and family that help control um, love and what people do. There were rules for courtship and marriage. There's community pressure. There's all, all these cultural factors for how you live your life and how you deal with this stuff instead of just um, being a libertine, um, pursuing whatever sounds fun in the moment. Because they thought if people just did whatever on a whim and pursued their passions, it was dangerous and society would fall apart. And now our society... We have birth control and other things that make us in less danger than the world used to be. Our society is a lot more stable, so it can deal with more problems. But there are significant problems that have come from the changing of sexual morals and how people's attitudes to love and sex are. Like the, There's been some liberation of those kind of things, and it's come with some upsides, but also some downsides. Um, there's a lot more, like, single-parent homes, and that has caused a lot of misery. It's possible to do well as a good single parent, especially if you have a lot of money. But overall, if you just look at what happens on average in the average case, it works out less well. Um, it's hard, it causes problems, it makes things worse. Um, so back to Greece, they had, there's quite a few stories about the problems love have caused. Um, one of the well-known ones is Helen of Troy. There's a whole fucking war because um, Paris loved Helen and wanted her and took her back to Troy. And then, you know, Troy gets destroyed for that. So it would have been better if Paris had resisted temptation. That was not worth it. He should not have um, gone all out for love in that way. It caused a lot of destruction. For more info on this, 
I recommend the books by Bruce Thornton. Thornton. Um, he has one called Greek Ways, which is really good, and it has a section on this, and it has sections on various other important Greek ideas that have uh, influenced and shaped the modern world in a lot of ways. And also he has a more specific book called Eros, the Myth of Ancient Greek Sexuality. He's a classicist. Um, he thanks Victor Davis Hanson in the acknowledgments, and he's a political writer for Front Page Magazine. So you may be familiar with some of those things. So this stuff about the danger of love and concepts like lovesick, um, because it was seen as kind of like a sickness that's actually dangerous in a significant way, um, not like the cold. There's this traditional knowledge about this stuff. And there's a lot of radicals who are just like, use your brain, think smart, rationally solve problems, and they haven't learned this stuff. They don't have it from life experience and like street smarts, and they don't have it from books either, which is dangerous. I'm um, kind of the intellectual type in general, so I get more of this kind of knowledge from books than large amounts of life experience in general. Um, like I, I focus more on book learning than the average person, but I still know about things like this and it's important. And I've watched TV and seen, you know, plenty of people uh, love gone wrong on TV. You know, that's a common thing as well. It's important to be aware of your culture and like the broad things that go on. So I think that there's like some sort of blindness or unwillingness to see in the kind of people who um, don't have much respect for the difficulties on this topic. So lots of people think things like I wouldn't get so infatuated that I started acting irrationally. And then they do. That's just naive. Or they think if it happens, they'll deal with it. They'll know how to just stop. You know, they'll fix it. But then they don't know how. And so many people have tried that kind of thing, and it's it hasn't worked. This, this stuff is hard. The success rate on plans like that is low. So one thing I wonder is, what have they ever accomplished in their lives that is a similar type of thing and a similar difficulty? What have they accomplished that's a similar type of thing, but like 90% of the difficulty, 80% of the difficulty, 70% of the difficulty? Where is their progression of accomplishments where they did something that was like a bit hard and then something a bit harder and so on? And they thought they were working their way up to being able to outcompete Eros slash Cupid, the fucking god. Like what makes them think they're more powerful than a force so powerful people thought of it as a god and personified it as a god because that's how big a role it played in life and um, how hard to deal with they found it. They saw it kind of like a force of nature, like lightning strikes and that kind of thing, um, that they had little control over and it was scary. And that's a reasonable perspective on it. And so what makes people think that they're so powerful, that they're more powerful than that kind of force in the world? And this is independent of what you think the underlying cause is. Like, I think it's culture rather than laws of physics or logic or something like that. Um, but that doesn't stop it from being an extremely powerful force that's hard to change. So if they had done things like uh, have rational discussions about Valentine's Day and have that go really well and successful and stuff you know that would be like a step in the right direction but there should be a progression of like many steps in the right direction of demonstrating and succeeding at skill at going against their culture so from my notes um also basically with the greeks or other people even if they're wrong about the source of these things like they attribute something to a god rather than to memes. They're still broadly correct in their observations of what it's like, what it does to people, what its effects on the world are. Um, you know, even if they didn't know why something was happening, they saw what happened. That was reasonably accurate. So even if they have myths involved in this stuff and they have myths um, 
as part of how they explain it and look at it and what they think the causes are. Um, they were still looking at like what do people do and trying to explain um, the world around them of how people act and the problems people have, like lovesickness. And then a tangent on the lovesick thing. Today, there's a lot of problems where people mix medicine with disagreements. They attack dissidents, dissenters, unconventional people, outliers. And instead of saying you're wrong, they say you're unhealthy, you have a broken brain, it's an illness. There's ongoing massive abuse of this stuff in the United States today. It's a big um, problem for liberty. Um, it circumvents the criminal justice system in a fair amount of ways. Um, you can be locked up in a psychiatric prison called a hospital without getting a criminal trial, right? So that's something really bad that circumvents the rule of law, that it's possible to be imprisoned against your will without having been convicted of a crime by a jury. And also, some, some criminals get off using uh, mental illness defenses even though they were guilty of a crime, and they escape punishment. And so it can be really bad both ways. Um, if you're interested in that, look up Thomas Saws. Um, go to fallibleideas.com, and at the top, click on books, and then uh, I have Thomas Saws book recommendations there. And regarding this stuff, it's quite fucked up in the U.S. today, but it's worse in China. Um, I just saw an article. It's in the Atlantic. It's called China is Treating Islam Like a Mental Illness. So you can Google the title or you can find the link in the show notes if you want to read about it. So they've imprisoned around a million Muslims in China, and they're calling Islam and terrorism um, a mental illness, and they compare them to cancer. And it shows you the dangers of mixing dissent and different ideas with illness and health, which it's not going on so extremely in the U.S. The U.S. Um, like hides what they're doing more and limits the effects um, short of prison camps with a million people from a religious minority. But it's still, like conceptually, on principle, the U.S. is doing the same fucking thing. So I'm going to read you a quote. This is uh, translated from the official Chinese Communist Party. This is what they said. Um, to help explain their internment camps for Muslims. So, quote, Members of the public who have been chosen for re-education have been infected by an ideological illness. They have been infected with religious extremism and violent terrorist ideology, and therefore they must seek treatment from a hospital as an inpatient. The religious extremist ideology is a type of poisonous medicine, which confuses the mind of the people. If we do not eradicate religious extremism at its roots, the violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread all over like an incurable malignant tumor. So you can see the use of medicine to legitimize the suppression of dissent. And I say this even though um, I sympathize with wanting to suppress Islam and terrorism. Like, there's a serious problem there. Islam is dangerous, but its danger is a different thing than cancer or illness or poisonous medicine. Um, it shouldn't be treated in that category. And also, the Chinese government is horribly violent and oppressive and tyrannical. Um, and this, this message from the government is, it's more blatant than people would say in the U.S. today, but it is not actually, um, like, fundamentally different philosophically than how the majority of Americans think about mental illness stuff. <laughs>